Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the June session of the research seminar series. My name is Cheyenne and I'm a research assistant with the BC Brain Wellness Program. I'm very excited to be hosting today's event. Today we have guest speakers Cheyenne K. Manesh and Mikey Jose, who will be talking about their current projects. Their studies aim to understand how lifestyle interventions such as diet and music can help improve people uh, improve brain health in people with Parkinson's disease. The research seminar series features some amazing researchers here at UBC related to brain wellness. Participating in research can be a way to learn more and become empowered in your own health and brain wellness, which is why we will also be presenting an opportunity for involvement in a study at the end of each session. Before we dive into the session, I would first like to acknowledge that the BC Brain Wellness Program at the Javed Moafagian Center for Brain Health is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam peoples. I am also joining from Vancouver and would like to invite you all to take a moment to acknowledge and give thanks to the land that you're joining us from today. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. If you have any questions or thoughts throughout the session, please feel free to send them in the chat box and we will get to them during our Q&A. Please note that we will also be recording today's session and uploading it to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our wonderful speakers, Mikey and Cheyenne. Mikey Jose is a PhD neuroscience student at UBC pursuing research in music neuroscience. Graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Cognitive Systems at UBC in 2020, Mikey's research orientation lends itself well to multidisciplinary research as he continuously strives to bridge the gap between the arts and health and medicine. Mikey is passionate about validating the crucial role that music plays in everyday life and clinical settings and has received many opportunities to share his passion as a TEDx speaker an invited panelist at the UBC Neuroscience Colloquium Series and Vancouver Sym Symphony Orchestra's Roundtable Series and director of UBC Brain and Music Group. Outside of his academics, Mikey is a composer, songwriter, and musician. His passion for creating music and, deep, and a deep interest in neuroscience intertwined, driving him to understand more fully the incredible and holistic power of music. Our other speaker, Cheyenne K. Manesh, is a second year master's student in neuroscience at UBC, researching the effects of dietary interventions, particularly the ketogenic diet in Parkinson's disease. He graduated from Simon Fraser University with a Bachelor of Science in Behavioral Neuroscience with honors in 2020, where he began his journey of understanding the brain and its multitude of functions. Cheyenne is especially interested in the biological mechanisms of of neurological disorders and the effects of lifestyle interventions on them. In addition to research, Cheyenne is also a passionate teacher and has been a teaching assistant for anatomy and neuroanatomy courses at UBC for six consecutive semesters. I will now pass it over to our speakers, Mikey and Cheyenne. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cheyenne, for the introduction. A uh, very generous introduction. We're very happy to be here. Again, my name is Mikey Jose. And my colleague that is joining me today as well is Cheyenne Kamenesh, and we are both graduate students at uh, UBC, and we're both pursuing neuroscience, but we're also researchers at the BC Brain Wellness Program. And today we're going to be talking about lifestyle interventions in Parkinson's disease, and particularly about the studies that are upcoming, the studies that we are working on, and sharing that with all of you today for an opportunity to engage with this uh, when we start recruitment. So thank you, Cheyenne, for also providing the, um, the land acknowledgement for today. But we do want to continue to acknowledge and wherever you're joining from us today to really reflect on the lands that you are on um, as we are you know, borrowing this land from um, the traditional and ancestral unceded territories um, of, of uh, the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam peoples. So uh, today we're gonna begin talking about lifestyle interventions in Parkinson's disease. So your first question might be, what is a lifestyle intervention? What are lifestyle interventions? And so this can range from the things that you do every day um, and things that you might want to implement in everyday life. Things like exercise, diet, art, music, um, and things that you can, can, um, you can kind of implement in everyday life. And so what we are interested in our lab here is to look at it as a supplementary tool to clinical treatment. 
and looking into trying to target uh, the prevention of the disease and to also look at improving brain health overall. So our lab's goal here is not just to implement these interventions, but actually understand the mechanisms and the effects of these interventions. And we would like to validate it in Parkinson's disease, uh, specifically because we belong to a Parkinson's lab. And um, all of these lifestyle interventions have been shown, uh, especially with um, other lifestyle interventions like exercise, to actually improve brain health overall. So today we're actually gonna be focusing on two different lifestyle interventions, specifically diet and music. And we're going to go through the entire research pipeline of um, why we think that this is an important research question to um, this, this specific population, um, and then our plan of action and what we're gonna be doing throughout the study. So today we're going to be talking specifically about diet and music, and I will pass the floor to Cheyenne to talk about his study on the ketogenic diet. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Cheyenne. And thank you to everyone who is present at this meeting and for your interest in learning more about the research. Um, so the project that I'm going to talk about today is called Ketogenic Diet Interventions in Parkinson's Disease, Safeguard Safeguarding the Gut Microbiome. To start, uh, I'm going to cover a little bit of background of, of why we think this is an important uh, topic to be investigated. Uh, what are some of the questions that we're going to ask and uh, how we're trying to answer them? What are the methods that we're using to answer these questions? And last but not least, what is the significance of this project and where it can lead to? Oh, I think you just muted yourself. Sorry. Uh, Parkinson's disease uh, uh, is best characterized by um, the motor symptoms, the tremor, the slowness of movement, uh, the, the rigidity. Um, however, one of the best characterized and most consistently reported symptoms of Parkinson's disease are gastrointestinal symptoms, such as constipation, that are often reported very early during the progress of the disease. Um, these actually can happen uh, years before the onset of any motor symptoms. This has made the researchers and the scientific community at large to uh, pose a question, could Parkinson's disease be originating from the gut? Uh, or what is the implication of the gut system in general with Parkinson's disease? What is its involvement? We know that the gut system is connected to the brain directly, uh, and uh, we know that it, it, it changes that happen within the gut system can influence the brain. Long story short, uh, they started looking at, by they I mean the scientific community, started looking at the um, microbiome, which is basically the collection of microorganisms, bacteria, um, uh, different fungi that live within the uh, human digestive, uh, digestive tract, and realized that, in fact, the gut microbiome of uh, patients with Parkinson's disease is different. It's somehow altered from that of uh, those people without Parkinson's disease. Um, there are the several implications of what this could mean. Um, there are some uh, other downstream biopathological uh, events that could happen, such as leaky gut and inflammation. I'm not going to uh, really focus on the technicalities here, but rather I want to focus this talk on what can be done about each of these aspects. So we know that uh, there is a problem with the gut microbiome. Let's talk about what can be done about it. Well, it turns out um, these gut microbiome, the, the gut microbiota, the bacterial strains within the gut system, are very respondent to changes in dietary, um, to, to, to changes in the diet or dietary regimens. Um, and one of uh, these dietary regimens that have shown to be very promising and very beneficial for changes in gut microbiome is the Mediterranean diet. Um, I will go into the specifics of the Mediterranean diet later, but in general, it is, a, it is mostly a plant-based diet. It's the quintessential healthy diet um, that really focuses on um, intake of green leafy vegetables and one of the uh, very crucial, uh, uh, crucial nutrients that are required for maintaining a healthy gut, which is fiber, dietary fiber. However, Parkinson's disease is not isolated to the gut. We know that there's something also happening in the brain which is why uh, we are going to talk about um, some of the problems in the brain. Please, thank you. Um, one of the other uh, pathological hallmarks of uh, Parkinson's disease is something that we call a bioenergetic deficit. 
Basically, what is happening is that in Parkinson's disease, the brain cells are not as efficient in utilizing glucose as a fuel source to produce cellular energy. Why is this happening? Well, it turns out that the power plant of the cells or the mitochondria have a very specific deficit in Parkinson's disease that makes them uh, less efficient in producing uh, ATP or cellular energy. Again, let's uh, focus on what can be done about this. And as, as it turns out, um, there are ways to bypass or circumvent this bioenergetic deficit. The brain is more like a nuclear power plant. It's very sophisticated. If something is wrong, it finds a way to um, circumvent the issue. In this scenario, if glucose is not able to be utilized properly, the brain uses an alternative source of energy. This alternative source of energy comes in the forms of ketone bodies and other molecular ty uh, type of molecules uh, that can be utilized to produce energy. What is particularly interesting about ketone bodies and the relationship with Parkinson's disease is that they specifically circumvent, they can specifically bypass the very deficit that is causing the mitochondria to be less efficient in producing um, cellular energy. So they're very uh, useful in that sense. How can we produce these ketone bodies? One simple way to do that would be by fasting. Once you not eat something for or anything for, for an extended period of time, your body starts to automatically break down the fat storage, uh, fat storages or stored fats in your body and um, turn them into ketone bodies that can be utilized by different cells, including your brain cells. Another way to do that would be through consumption of a ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet uh, utilizes um, the, the same principles by virtue of consuming a lot of fat while reducing the consumption of uh, carbohydrates. So it forces the body into a state called ketosis in which the body starts producing ketone bodies by breaking down excessive fatty tissues. Um, ketogenic diets have been tried in other uh, uh, disorders, specifically in uh, epi epilepsy, and they have been very successful in uh, treating uh, especially drug-resistant epilepsy in children, and they have been uh, shown to be uh, beneficial in Parkinson's disease. However, there is a catch. By their very nature, they are very limited in terms of the number of nutrients that are available um, to, to, be, to be utilized by the body because they mostly rely on fats and the um, consumption of carbohydrates is very limited in these diets. And as you remember from the uh, microbiome slide, one of the very key ingredients that are necessary for maintaining a healthy gut is fiber, which is lacking in ketogenic diets. Therefore, these diets, the classical ketogenic diets have been uh, associated with uh, alterations or changes in the gut microbiome that may not be um, ideal. So uh, we asked ourselves a question. We have a dietary regimen that is beneficial in uh, circumventing the bioenergetic deficits, but this diet is, is not necessarily healthy or may not be ideal for the uh, health of the gut microbiome. However, we do have another dietary regimen that is um, proven to be healthy for the gut microbiome. Why can't we combine the principles of both to harvest the benefits of the two diet? And this is uh, where the Mediterranean ketogenic diet comes into play. Mediterranean ketogenic diet, as the name implies, utilizes the principles of both diets. Uh, and it has been uh, studied before in the context of other disorders. In fact, it is uh, showing to be um, more beneficial than classical uh, uh, ketogenic diets for the health of the gut microbiome. Um, but it hasn't been tried in Parkinson's disease. That, that's one of our goals to uh, see whether this uh, dietary intervention would be good for Parkinson's disease. However, there is also another way to um, induce or increase the amount of ketone bodies in the body, and that's by consuming other sources of uh, um, in, or, or other ingredients that are a source of ketones themselves. Um, one such source would be uh, a medium chain triglyceride oil, and it's uh, basically uh, in short, it's called MCT oil, and it's, a, it's an extract of coconut oil. I will explain more about MCT oils in an upcoming slides, but just the main fact here is that ketone bodies can be produced 
by consumption of exogenous forms of ketone bodies, meaning that ketone bodies that are not produced by the body, but are consumed. So with that rationale in mind, we are, we are going to ask a few important questions and design a few uh, important aims. First and foremost, the main role of this study is going to be determining the safety and feasibility of the ketogenic Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean diet supplemented with MCT oil uh, in, in a Parkinson-specific cohort. And we are going to do that by asking a, very, uh, a couple of uh, important questions. First, are these diets going to be safe for the health of the gut microbiome for patients with Parkinson's disease? Second, what is the feasibility and adherence like for these diets? Are they going to be liked by the participants? Are they going to be uh, seen as beneficial by the participants? And lastly, we're going to explore, just touch on uh, some of the biological and clinical outcomes of, uh, of these um, dietary interventions, seeing whether they do have any effects, but this is not central to the study. And the reason for that, I will explain later. But the main, uh, the main important point about our aims is that we are going to um, examine and investigate the safety and feasibility of these studies. So we are going to, uh, if we are going to answer these uh, studies, we need to uh, design a study that is focused around that. And to do that, we are utilizing a method called a randomized crossover method. Uh, let me walk you through what this study would entail and how would this study um, determine and help us answer the questions that were posed. At first, we are going to determine the eligibility of the potential participants using some screening procedures. After we determine that they will be eligible to participate in the study, they will conduct a first pre-intervention visit where we collect a, a blood sample, a fecal sample, and run some clinical assessments after which we're going to randomize the people, so randomly assign uh, the participants to one of our two um, dietary interventions. So either the Mediterranean ketogenic diet intervention or the Mediterranean diet supplemented with MCT supplements, uh, with MCT oil. The participants will then spend about eight weeks uh, in one of these, follow, uh, one of these respective uh, dietary interventions, after which they will come back and we collect another set of samples and run another set of clinical assessments as a post-intervention data collection. Uh, and we ask the participants to uh, go back home and live life as though they never even participated in studies. So basically go back to their pre-study lifestyle and dietary habits. We call this a washout period. Uh, they're going to spend eight weeks in the washout period after which they're going to come back and we're going to collect another set of samples and another set of data collection. At this point, they will be adhering to the other dietary intervention. So if they started the study with, let's say Mediterranean ketogenic diet, now they will uh, adhere to the Mediterranean diet supplemented with MCT oil. This second phase will also take eight weeks after which um, there will be a final visit and a final set of data collection. So this is what we call a randomized crossover design. Here's, uh, here are some of the eligibility criteria for this study. Um, you can participate in this study or, or people who can participate in this study uh, are going to be between the ages of 40 to 85, have a confirmed diagnosis of Parkinson's disease uh, and their Parkinson's disease is mild to moderate in nature and they are on stable Parkinson's medication for at least one month. If you have any of the following criteria, they will not be able to participate in the study. And these criteria include atypical Parkinsonism, um, if they uh, score less than 21 in our cognitive assessment task, um, any medical or psychiatric conditions that would prevent full participation or inability to fill in our electronic questionnaires or understand or study instructions. If they have any significant difficulty with swallowing or if they are diabetic or using insulin, or if they are on any sort of anticoagulation medication with bleeding disorders, um, such as warfarin, um, if they have inflammatory bowel disease, uh, use of any medication that would target the immune system, immunomodulatory medications, use of probiotics or antibiotics um, four weeks or three months before the start of uh, this, uh, the trial respectively. 
Um, use of MCT oil or ketogenic diets in the past eight weeks prior to start of the trial, uh, or if they're allergic to MCT oil, coconut oil, or coconuts in general. And last but not least, if they are pregnant or they're planning to become pregnant through the months of the study. So let's uh, shift gear and talk about the study interventions. Um, the first intervention that I wanna talk about is a Mediterranean diet supplemented with medium chain triglycerides. So again, as I mentioned, medium chain triglycerides are a specific kind of fatty acids that are extracted from coconut oil. So they're organic in nature and they're plant-based. Uh, what they do is that they uh, are, the body is able to convert them to ketone bodies after consumption, meaning that they do not rely on the sort of diet that you are on, uh, but rather the pure act of consuming these oils will turn them into ketone bodies. So you can be on a completely normal diet and consume ketogenic uh, uh, MCT oil and see some ketogenic benefits. The, uh, the MCT oil that we will be using for this study is called Nutiva MCT oil. You may have seen it before in super, uh, supermarkets or other um, supplement, supplement stores. Um, and that is because it is Health Canada approved and can be purchased by anyone. Uh, the dose that we have in mind for this is about two tablespoons of MCT oil twice daily. Uh, we're, this is our target dose. We're going to increase little by little to get to this tar target dose. We're going to probably start by about one teaspoon twice daily. And this is to give your body um, enough time to acclimate um, with, with this new supplement. Uh, and again, as I mentioned briefly before, the Mediterranean diet uh, really encourages the consumption of green leafy vegetables, nuts, fiber-rich uh, nutrients, um, such as fiber-rich grains and fiber-rich vegetables. Uh, and it's going to focus on fish and poultry as the main sources of protein while limiting the consumption of processed food, sweets, and red meat to a great extent. On the other hand, our Mediterranean ketogenic diet uh, is going to um, be um, a little bit different. It's going to uh, utilize the principles of both Mediterranean diet and ketogenic diet. On the right side of the screen, uh, you can see the classical uh, ketogenic diet pyramid, we're going to alternate that in, a, in, in, in some ways. So um, again, still 70 to 75% of the caloric intake is gonna come from healthy fats. Um, these healthy fats are going to be different from those that are used in ketogenic diets uh, or classical ketogenic diet, mostly in the sense that there will be from plant-based sources such as olive oil, avocados, or coconut oil, while uh, not as much from dairy sources such as cheese. Um, again, the uh, protein consumption, sorry, the consumption of red meat is going to be reduced and um, in, in, in it's going to be in favor of uh, consuming more poultry and fish as the main sources of protein. Proteins are going to constitute about 15% of the caloric intake. And we have increased the uh, carbohydrate intake from 5% from the classical ketogenic diets to about 10% to make some more room for uh, ingestion of fibers. Uh, throughout the study, the participants will have uh, regular check-ins with a registered dietitian. Um, moreover, they will fill in uh, daily uh, or weekly, once per, once per week, uh, one-day entries uh, of their food, food intake. So they will just keep track of uh, what they're having one day and record that once per week and report that to the registered dietitian. And the registered dietitian can use that information to um, either guide you through uh, how ways that you can improve your adherence, or if it's already great, then uh, keep doing what you're doing. Um, and moreover, all participants will be provided with a um, breath ketone uh, meter. It's a device that uh, basically determines the amount of ketone bodies in your body. And it tells us how well the diet is doing what it's supposed to be doing, meaning that producing ketogenic um, or ketone bodies. So last but not least, let's quickly touch on some of the, what, what are some of the significance of this trial and what is uh, uh, in the back for the future. Uh, the main outcomes of the trial is going to be determining the safety of uh, the two interventions uh, that I mentioned, so the Mediterranean ketogenic and the Mediterranean uh, diet supplemented with MCT oil with respect to the gut microbiome. 
we're going to be utilizing a combination of microbiology, molecular physiology, and clinical assessments to determine that. But that's not all. We're also going to see whether these uh, dietary interventions are feasible, meaning that uh, we want to answer whether they do what they are supposed to be doing, whether the participants like these dietary regimens or not, and how do they feel about them. And also, what is the likelihood of the participants adhering to these diets even after the um, end of the study, meaning that how, how well do the participants rate these um, um, dietary interventions? What are the pros and cons of each of these dietary interventions? But this is not all because um, this is just a, a part of our team's uh, greater effort to establish protocols for safe and effective ketogenic interventions. In fact, this is, in fact, this is just the first phase of a larger ketogenic diet project in which we're going to be um, using the information that we gather from this trial uh, in a larger clinical trial in which the main question asked will be, how well do these diets do what they're supposed to do as compared to other controlled diets? Meaning that we're going to uh, determine the, uh, the efficacy of these diets. But that's just part of our dietary intervention um, uh, studies. And as Mikey will talk to you in a second, we also have other uh, lifestyle interventions uh, that are going to be very important. Thank you, Cheyenne. Um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit from talking about diet and the gut microbiome to something a little bit different. Um, so this project that I'll be presenting now is called Targeting Apathy with a Music-Based Intervention in Parkinson's Disease. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background uh, first and talking about um, why we're choosing to look at apathy in Parkinson's disease specifically. So as Cheyenne has, has beautifully mentioned at the beginning, um, Parkinson's disease is very well known as a motor disorder and a motor disease, uh, but there are also uh, non-motor symptoms that are prevalent within the Parkinson's disease community and population, one of them being apathy. Now, apathy, we are going to define it here as decreased motivation and goal-directed behavior. So this can be as simple as having, uh, not having the motivation to get out of bed today or going for a walk. Now, apathy is a distinct symptom and a distinct diagnosis separate from depression and anhedonia, and it's independently associated with decreased daily functioning and quality of life and treatment resistance. And so the prevalence of apathy in Parkinson's disease um, is actually anywhere between 25 to even 70% in some populations, especially with, um, with the development of, of cognitive disorders. Um, so it turns out that uh, music can actually, um, listening to music actually affects the same areas of your brain that are affected by apathy. And so we call this brain network in our brains, uh, the reward network. And so when you listen to music, when um, you and I listen to music, it's been shown that um, rewarding and pleasurable music actually activates this reward network. And it is this network that we hypoth hypothesize to be affected in Parkinson's patients with apathy. Now, we also notice um, what we call um, increased functional connectivity, which is just a very fancy way of calling, uh, of, of naming brain crosstalk. So when your different regions of your brain talk to each other and the different regions that talk to each other when you're listening to music that is pleasurable and that's rewarding are the auditory centers, which processes sound, and the reward centers, which we talked about. Now, music listening has also been shown to alleviate apathy, actually, in patients with dementia and other neurological disorders. Uh, but the gap is we're trying to understand how music may target apathy in Parkinson's disease particularly. So we've looked at um, how music and music interventions have been used to target apathy in other populations. But in terms of actually looking at the mechanisms and understanding how music may work to target apathy and Parkinson's is the main aim of this study. So I'm going to go over four main aims of the study um, in a little bit more depth here, um, starting and we're going to break it down here, starting with this first aim. So our first aim is to really look at this brain connectivity, this brain crosstalk and the differences in this brain activity in patients with Parkinson's disease and uh, participants without, uh, with and without apathy. So we're really wanting to understand further just the baseline differences in the brain connectivity in Parkinson's patients who have apathy and those without. 
Um, our second aim is to really now look at the effects of music on different measures of apathy um, and looking at functional uh, connectivity measures of apathy, but also looking at um, physical measures. So um, actually participating in a task that requires effort and requires sustained effort, um, as well as your typical clinical paper and pen apathy tasks uh, and measures as well. So we're hoping to look at this in one session um, and also um, in an eight week, over an eight week music listening intervention period, which will be aim three. So really observing any large changes or any changes at all over an eight week music listening intervention period. And so the, the, um, the hope here is to actually look at a smaller scale to see what uh, the difference are, dif differences are within listening to music and um, in music and audio intervention within one session. And then AIM-3 is really looking at uh, a, long, a, a longer period of time over an eight week music listening period. Finally, similarly to uh, Cheyenne's study, we are also wanting to test any lasting effects of the intervention through this washout period where uh, participants will not be um, will we'll resume the habits that they were um, sustaining before the study um, commenced. And so I'll go a little bit into depth of what the study timeline looks like here. So first um, I'll go over uh, the full timeline and then a little bit of the criteria of um, who we're looking for for the study. So before all of any of this happens, we will have a screening and a pre-screening visit. Uh, which will usually happen over the phone um, over or over Zoom. And this is really to test your uh, eligibility for the study. Um, but if you are eligible and once you're eligible for the study, then you will go through this uh, process starting from this pre-visit um, music preference assessment test. And so basically what this is, is that we're going to play a sequence of music about 20 second excerpts long, and we're going to ask you to rate how much you like this piece of music and how motivated and rewarding you find this piece, these pieces of music. And so we're going to be using basically what we're gathering from this music preference assessment, um, what you prefer in your music, um, in our fMRI session in visits one and two. And I'll go through that um, in a little bit more depth in a second here. So once you're done your pre-visit in a couple of days, you will actually visit us in person. Um, and that is what visit one is. So the first thing that you'll be doing is going through a battery of consent assessments, questionnaires, um, and um, answering more of the, these paper and pen tests uh, with a, uh, a researcher. And you'll also be undergoing a hearing exam just to make sure that you're eligible for the study and that you're hearing the music and, and the audio um, interventions properly. So then you will have a, a bit of a 30 minute break uh, before your fMRI session. So fMRI stands for functional magnetic resonance imaging, and it sounds quite complex, but really it's not that it's not that bad. Um, if you've ever been um, at, gone to a hospital for surgery, um, you might have seen an MRI machine, which this basically is the same thing. And so it's a large tube uh, where uh, with with a large magnet that surrounds you. So what you'll will be hoping to do here with participants is to um, put participants in the scanner and just measure their brain and brain activity at rest uh, while they're not doing anything. And then uh, during a music listening task. So we'll um, guide you through this process and give you instructions on a music listening task. And then we are going to again look at the brain activity uh, through that task. Finally, after this fMRI session, we are going to be um, going through a tutorial and an, an intervention tutorial and how you're going to be carrying out the next eight weeks of uh, your life, basically. So the eight week intervention involves um, two different groups randomized, and you're going to be listening to different types of audio, whether it be um, a type of uh, music that you love or um, podcasts that you enjoy. And so what we're hoping to see over this eight week period is for you to listen and engage uh, actively in, in, in music and audio listening. And we're hoping to see um, any pre or post effects of listening to these um, types of audio and intervention and seeing if anything changes in terms of apathy measures as well as your brain connectivity pre and post this intervention. Um, so once you're done this eight week intervention, you'll come back in person and it would be, this is now your visit two, which kind of mir mirrors exactly what you're doing on visit one, where you're going through an assessment and questionnaire battery, doing some clinical measures and seeing uh, and, and measuring apathy scores, and then going through another fMRI session where you're going to be 
uh, uh, measured and in your brain activity is going to be measured over that time. And then measuring and comparing the differences between brain activity as well as clinical measures pre and post this intervention. Um, the last step of the study will be a four weeks off period where you will um, be going kind of back to normal and back to your usual schedule and not um, necessarily adhering to the, the strict listening protocol throughout the intervention. So the intervention actually we, uh, we um, suggest listening to music for about an hour a day for the eight weeks. And so this four weeks off, you will kind of go back to your baseline, whatever you were doing before. So you can still listen to music, but maybe not as much um, as you were before. And then we're going to have you come in for a third visit four weeks after just to um, go through another assessment and questionnaire battery and see if any of the clinical aspects um, of apathy and other clinical aspects of your Parkinson's disease uh, changes or not. So in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria, we are also very similarly looking at those between ages 40 and 85 at enrollment, just with a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And uh, you have to be on the on state, so that means you're on medication, um, specifically levodopa. And exclusion criteria includes things like atypical Parkin Parkinsonism, um, if uh, there's any history of epilepsy or other neuro neurological diseases or complications, um, looking at significant cognitive impairment, so um, those who score um, highly on the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, um, or, or low on the cogn Montreal Cognitive Assessment, rather, um, or those who have moderate depression, those who have had severe multiple head traumas, and exclusion criteria pertaining to the uh, MRI testing protocol. Because the MRI machine is, very, uh, is a very strong magnet, anyone who has any uh, metal or medical implants that have any metal on it uh, will have to be excluded from the study just because it is a very dangerous place to be um, if you have those. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about the outcomes and the significance of this study. So the outcomes, we hope to really just have this deeper understanding of Parkinson's as a whole and apathy specifically, and what may lead to the alleviation of apathy. Um, so again, a lot of uh, Parkinson's research focuses on uh, prognosis and diagnosis of the motor symptoms, but we're really interested in looking at the non-motor symptoms that really affects daily, uh, daily life and quality of life of patients with Parkinson's disease. We're also really excited about the study because we are going to be obtaining valuable mechanistic data. So basically data of um, describing how this music intervention and how the intervention may work and looking at um, the actual gears that are turning in, um, in our brains and what's actually happening when music interacts with our brains. Um, so, Another outcome that we are hoping to uh, have from the study is to establish this and invalidate this non-invasive, non-drug intervention that can easily be used in clinical settings and can be implemented very easily in, um, in your homes. So future directions for the study are to really use this um, first study as the groundwork for developing other interventions uh, for other brain disorders. So using the mechanisms and using the way that music is being used and how the brain interacts with it and using that mechanism to start developing interventions, uh, not just for Parkinson's disease and not just targeting apathy, but for other brain disorders um, and symptoms, uh, things, uh, other disorders uh, like dementia, Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia. This is also really groundwork for um, important future work in validating arts-based approaches and using arts-based approaches in clinical settings. Um, in, in the future and, and farther in the future, we're hoping to look into the actual features of music, the, the features of the music that actually leads to better outcomes and better brain, uh, brain health outcomes. And that may, and looking into how those may be contributing to these rewarding effects. Now I'm gonna pass the mic back to Cheyenne. There are a lot of studies that are actually still ongoing and studies that will start to be recruiting soon. And so Cheyenne will undergo and um, explain some of these studies that are happening in this lab. Thank you, Mikey. Yes, as Mikey um, alluded to, there are a lot of other uh, ongoing and other upcoming research projects that uh, are happening at our lab and at BC Brain Wellness and our CRESPO lab, which is the lab that we are involved with. Uh, one such study is the PPRC or Pacific Parkinson Research Center Registry Study. 
The objective for this study is to create a comprehensive clinical database that can be used to gain a better understanding of movement disorders and Parkinson's disease. The study has already consented over 1,200 patients uh, to take part, uh, with 800 of whom being uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, another study that we have going on right now is the TAP clinical trial. Uh, the objective of this study is to examine the effects of an oral probio probiotic supplement, uh, which contains nine bacterial strains on uh, anxiety symptoms and on gut microbiome and on inflammation blood markers uh, or markers in the blood, uh, and involves uh, taking uh, a placebo or a probiotic twice a day for a period of 12, 12 weeks. Uh, this study so far has enrolled uh, uh, 46 participants and has an overall goal of 72 participants to be enrolled. Another uh, one of our upcoming research projects that uh, we are very excited about is the PRO-D clinical trial. Um, probiotic treatment of depression, uh, treatment for depression and associated mood disorders in Parkinson's disease. It's very similar to the TAP clinical trial, where the uh, objective is to examine the effects of a probiotic strain uh, or probiotic supplement on depressive symptoms, gut microbiome, and inflammation markers, uh, with the only difference being uh, the addition of an MRI imaging task to determine the brain networks involved and the effects of the microbiome, uh, or sorry, the effects of the uh, probiotic on, on the brain uh, networks as well. This study will start recruitment in fall of 2022. If you are interested in any of the upcoming projects or any of the ongoing projects and you would like to participate in them, please visit the BC Brain Wellness website and uh, click on the participation and research button on the homepage. Um, there you can fill out your information and the research uh, coordinators will be in touch with you and provide you with more information about different research studies that are happening um, at BC Brain Wellness. Thank you very much again for uh, all of your uh, participation and for your interest in research and uh, for the research process. Thank you both so much. Um, that was really fascinating. And I think it's a really exciting time to see the potential of this em emerging work on uh, lifestyle interventions and what this may mean for overall brain health. Um, there are a couple questions here. If you do have questions, please send them in the chat and we will get to as many as possible. Um, we'll start with one for you, Cheyenne. Um, what were some of the findings from previous trials studying ketogenic diets in Parkinson's disease? Yes, of course. So these studies, there have been three different studies that looked at ketogenic diets in Parkinson's disease. They, uh, they have all found that uh, motor and non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease have been uh, improved after uh, adhering to ketogenic diets for a certain amount of time. Uh, non-motor symptoms more so than motor symptoms. Uh, however, none of these studies have looked at the effects of the ketogenic diet on the gut microbiome in Parkinson's patients. Therefore, our study is going to be one of the first ones that is going to be, have that specific lens and look through that lens uh, on the impact of uh, ketogenic diets on Parkinson's disease. That's exciting. And um, what about MCT oil? Has that been studied at all before in Parkinson's? MCT oil has never been studied in Parkinson's disease. It has been studied in, uh, in the context of other neurological disorders, such as mild cognitive impairment and uh, Alzheimer's. Um, it has been shown to increase uh, the uptake of blood ketones by more than 230%. So we know that it is ketogenic in nature, um, but it has never been, and it has been associated with positive uh, cognitive um, symptoms or alleviation of the cognitive symptoms in those with uh, mild cognitive impairment. Therefore, um, we are expecting to see similar effects, similar um, bioenergetic compensations in Parkinson's disease as well. Great, thank you. Um, and Mikey, have uh, music interventions been studied in Parkinson's disease before? And do you know anything about playing music and, that's, and its effect on brain health? Uh, that's Those are great questions. So actually, um, music and music-based interventions were actually first used in Parkinson's research to address these uh, motor symptoms. So a lot of the research actually so far in Parkinson's disease and music have been looking at how music and specifically the rhythm of music uh, can help align the gait of Parkinson's patients. Uh, so a lot of research that have come out have um, 
observed and analyzed how the outer rhythms of music can actually align the inner rhythms and, and create this, what they call synchrony between the two. Um, so it's really fascinating work, um, but I think what is exciting about uh, the work that we're doing and the work that um, is emerging now are ways of addressing the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, so things like apathy and, and regulating mood. And so that is definitely uh, in its earlier stages in Parkinson's research, and the, especially looking at the mechanisms again, looking at how it's happening is really in its infancy. So uh, I think we're getting in on this at, at a good time. Yeah, that's really exciting. These things we we probably take advantage of. You know, we listen to music so often in our day to day lives and have no no idea of what it's really you know the benefits it's really having on us. So that's exciting. Right. Sorry. And I, I think there was a second part to that question I might have missed. Is was it about playing music or something? It was like yeah, playing music. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of the research in music uh, interventions are actually a lot of different ways of engaging with music. So the study that we're focusing on is really on the listening side of things, just because it's the most accessible. But, uh, you know, music therapy is a, a tool that is used in a lot of clinical settings um, in terms of actually making music. Um, I think that um, there's, uh, there are a, a couple of papers that have demonstrated that music compared to any other stimulus, any kind of artistic stimulus or uh, natural stimulus really engages most of the brain, if not all of the brain, and especially when you're engaging with music and you're actually playing it or you're um, actively creating it. So I, um, you know, colloquial in, in my personal life, it's it's been something that I've um, I've witnessed is something that has really helped. Uh, but in terms of actually seeing its effects in, in clinical settings and validating it. Um, it's, it's a really interesting thing. And especially looking at music therapy, if you're looking at um, active uh, forms of music therapy, it's something that's available and something that is, um, um, is, is being used in a lot of clinical populations, just uh, beyond uh, Parkinson's disease too. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question here for you, Mikey. Um, would you expect similar effects with listening to things in general, say a podcast or the news, or would these benefits really be um, isolated only to music? That's another great question. So part of our results and hypotheses, we're hoping to, to actually see and determine if there are any differences. Uh, of course, there are, you know, personality differences, things, you know, some uh, colloquial, I've been talking about this with other people, and some people really like podcasts, and some people really like, uh, pr prefer music to podcasts. Um, and other different types of audio. But what we're hoping to see and uncover here is really looking at if there is anything unique about uh, music, whether it be the, you know, the personal connections that we make with it or uh, the context that music um, kind of comes in and seeing if those interactions actually kind of put it in above and beyond other music and audio interventions. Uh, but that is still yet to be seen and um, we'll hopefully see that in, uh, through this research. Great. Thank you. Um, Cheyenne, a question here for you. Um, can you speak a little bit more to this potential link between the gut and Parkinson's disease? Um, I can speak a little bit more about the uh, effects that we um, expect to see in consumption of ketogenic diet uh, on the gut microbiome and see uh, and, and the way that it, way it may affect the brain um, in, in different ways. Uh, so, for instance, uh, as I as I mentioned, fiber is one of the very important um, food sources for the bacteria that live within the gut system. Um, these bacteria then use to uh, use fiber and break it down into another um, another molecule called short chain fatty acids, and these fatty acids can then go on to the brain and throughout different parts of the body and have different impacts. Uh, but aside from that, the brain is also directly connected to the gut with a single um, nerve called the vagus nerve. And uh, we think that uh, there might be direct communication between the gut system and the brain system through this pathway as well. So, so far, we have two pathway com pathways communicating. We have the um, short-chain fatty acids, which are basically a signaling molecule when it comes to brain. We also have the direct pathway. But there's also a third way, and that will be through the interactions of the gut microbiome uh, to the brain via the immune system. Um, some of the, um, some of the uh, actions or some of the um, potential pathological uh, pathways can, um, that, that are happening in the gut can activate the immune system, uh, which in turn can be transmitted to the brain as well and um, communicate messages across the two media. So from the brain to the, uh, to the gut system. 
So three different pathways that the gut and the brain can communicate with each other. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think that's something we typically think of as being as interconnected as it is. But um, yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, and one more question here for you, Cheyenne. Um, what are the measures or the outcomes that you're using to determine whether your interventions are successful or not? You mentioned feasibility. Um, were there some other, um, you mentioned clinical as well. Can you just touch on that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So um, again, our main our, our main measure for determining um, uh, for our main outcome measures for this trial is going to be determining the safety and feasibility. These are the two central points to the study. Safety uh, is going to be determined using um, a couple of different um, uh, outcome measures, basically. One is going to be a measure that about uh, the level of gut inflammation. So the previous studies that looked at ketogenic diet and gut have realized that there are ways by which this diet, the classical version of the diet, can cause uh, inflammation in the gut system. Now, the um, combined Mediterranean ketogenic diets, when it was studied, it showed that there's no such thing as gut inflammation when it's used in combination with Mediterranean principles. Um, so one of our uh, outcome measures is going to be seeing if there is going to be any uh, gut inflammation uh, with the Mediterranean ketogenic diets uh, or not. Second one is going to be leaky gut. Uh, back to the short chain fatty acids, those signaling molecules. One of the other things that they do is that they provide, um, they're, they're an essential source of energy for the cells in, in the gut. And uh, if the cells in the gut are not provided with enough energy, meaning that when the, when the gut microbiome does not have enough food source to produce those short chain fatty acids, um, those um, cells in the gut, they're going to dissociate from each other and basically create a gap that is going to allow um, things from within the gut to leak outside, a phenomenon we call leaky gut. So we're going to use another um, biomarker that is going to measure the amount of leaky gut uh, or the amount of leakiness within the gut. Um, that's, these are our main uh, safety parameters. Uh, with regards to feasibility, we're going to see whether um, the diets that we are uh, implementing are able to produce the amount of ketone bodies that we uh, determine to be sufficient for um, uh, having a beneficial effect. Uh, also, we're going to see um, what is the retention rate. Are people going to um, con continue adhering to these diets or is um, adher adherence to these diets going to be too difficult? Um, so yeah, these are going to be main um, outcome measures for uh, feasibility. Oh, and of course, as in addition to um, getting a better insight into the perspective of participants by conducting qualitative interviews, asking them about uh, the pros and cons of each of these dietary interventions individually, and uh, how would they like these uh, in, uh, interventions to be altered to render them more beneficial for them. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it looks like that's all the questions that we have today. So that will wrap up today's research seminar series. A huge thank you to both of our wonderful speakers, Mikey and Cheyenne, for helping us learn more about Parkinson's research and the opportunity to get involved. And thank you to everyone for tuning in and joining us today. And we hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.